uh, thank you so much. I want to say hello to everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation. And thank you to uh, particularly Dr. Amelia Kuhn, who I've worked with in previous uh, iterations before she came to Global Ethics with the World Council of Churches. And thank you uh, for the opportunity to share. Um, my uh, perspective is around uh, what is now being called diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, what is being called the DEI in the U.S. context. Uh, as you may uh, know, um, many of the points that my colleague has already mentioned around diversity and demographics, uh, these, these kinds of multi-expressions of religious life, social and cultural life exists in the U.S. Um, I didn't prepare a presentation to so much to bring the demographics as much as to wrestle with some of the ethical issues around the emerging paradigm within the U.S. of how we discuss diversity in the U.S. I am happy to answer more questions around the demographics and other details at a later point, but given the limited amount of time, I really wanted to dive right into the trends uh, that are happening in the U.S. context. And so uh, I hope this will still be of interest to everyone. Let me begin with my overview. Um, this overview uh, is an opportunity to uh, say that this presentation uh, is intended to query the divergent and complementary trends of ethical assumptions that are defining a more equitable, inclusive, and diverse community in the U.S. context. And this term DEI is how it's being currently captured. I'll say more about the definition of this in a moment. So the context, uh, U.S. institutions and movements within and outside of faith uh, perspectives or faith fears are wrestling with the frameworks for achieving this in a public space, but historic inequities persist. So I'm beginning with this conversation around how it is we work within these kind of contradictory frameworks of approaching uh, a kind of positive DEI or diversity, equity, inclusion uh, objective. Um, here again, uh, we're going to dig more deeply into some of the historic challenges that prevent or even hinder uh, the possibilities of what the vision is. So what is the real question here? The question is, is how can historic colonial institutions morally lead without careful scrutiny concerning the root causes of racism gender bias and economic disparities that inform these challenges today. Again, this is the fundamental ethical question I think is being asked as we look at this emerging paradigm of what is being called DEI in the United States. People like uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, I'm going to scroll up a little bit here, who I would encourage you to, to read a bit later if you have not, uh, in his book, Strength to Love, uh, provides a kind of primary resource, I think, in having this kind of discussion, uh, where he talks about this vision of the beloved community. Uh, Dr. Howard Thurman uh, is another one that I bring to mind uh, in his book, Jesus and the Disinherited. Um, uh, Dr. Thurman, Howard Thurman was a mystic and a theologian, and one who actually taught Dr. Martin Luther King. And so in these two gentlemen, you see this kind of intersection of the importance of the, the ethic of love and the ethic of uh, respect and tolerance, some of the things that my colleague mentioned, uh, but from a biblical theological perspective. I'll say more about that in a moment. But these are resources I invite you to invite, investigate later. And then also one of the movements that Dr. Cleary and I have been involved with, they were co-editors of a volume for the World Council of Churches, um, is around Pan-African Women's Ecumenical Empowerment. Uh, in this particular iteration, um, this uh, resource, you'll find different perspectives, particularly from women of African descent, who are speaking into some of these issues from their various locations in society. Yesterday, which some of us will know, um, we had a case study that uh, deals with some of these issues. Uh, we finally had some resolve of what is called the the Derek Chauvin um, case, the trial of um, Derek Chauvin relative to the death of George Floyd. This particular example of what everyone is really living with in the U.S. in this moment 
It just happens to be that we are here the day after the verdict on this case, uh, the three verdicts, I might add, in this case, that I think kind of shine light into some of these issues around where is there an ethic of love, where there's an ethic of really dealing with historical justices um, in this moment, and really calls into question how far the experiment on diversity can really work. And, and how does DEI, these principles of DEI, uh, get lifted up in this case study? Let me go right on to my next point here. Um, so let me further define what DEI is in the US context. Diversity, equity, inclusion is a term that is used to describe programs and policies that encourage representation and participation of diverse groups of peoples, including people of different genders, races and ethnicities, abilities and disabilities, religions, cultures, ages, and sexual orientations, and people with diverse backgrounds, experiences, and skills and expertise. It is an expansion of the term diversity and inclusion to reflect the growing focus on equity in organizations. DEI is not just a quote, feel good initiative. It is met uh, by, by virtue of research that diverse viewpoints at all levels of an organization improves quote, financial results, organizational team performance, innovation in other areas of organization, business or collectives. So the premise here is to actually change what has been assumptions in the past that the predominant white narrative, uh, which many have called white supremacy in the US context, has to shift to the assets of what diversity brings in all of its presentations to strengthen, as opposed to weaken uh, a system of, uh, of homogeneity, but rather to say that the diversities actually bring strength to the opportunity to be together, as Dr. Kuhn would call, the beloved community. This is a major shift uh, from the ways in which many of us have uh, been taught and grown up in, in the United, uh, raised in the United States, um, and is really being tested uh, as the demographics are changing in the United States uh, to a quote, quote, majority minority country. Uh, we see the increase that is happening. It is predicted in the demographics that by 2040 or even 2050, somewhere in there, that the US will be primarily made up of people of the quote minority uh, as the majority in the United States. So we're at a crucible moment in the United States. So what does that mean going forward? This idea of DEI, I think is, is rooted in scripture. Uh, Finally, all of you be like-minded, sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. First Peter 3, 8, I think is an example of a biblical text that actually is to some extent, uh, for me who is working from a theological perspective, helps to undergird this DEI approach. That being said, uh, there are major tests. <laughs> um, you know, going back to the, 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 the prior narrative of a more homogeneous narrative, to try to move to a more heterogeneous uh, uh, narrative of diversity. Dr. Martin Luther King envisioned a beloved community that has found successive favor in what I would call the Black, in what has been called the Black Lives Matter season for DEI principles in the US and global context. That includes communities historically marginalized from the benefits of the US, the majority of white that white communities enjoy in the United States. One of the key issues in all of this, as we look at this kind of DEI approach, however, is the historic wealth gap and other lack of benefits that we could name, which we don't have time to name, that exists before in this primarily white narrative in the United States. And so DEI is really tested uh, in some ways that it hasn't, that um, have not really been tested before because now there is more of an opening for this kind of discussion. DEI is a secular approximation of what Dr. King was talking about in terms of his beloved community. Um, but it doesn't have a recognition. This secular approach doesn't really have the full recognition of a biblical and ethical foundation of love, equity, 
compassion, humility, empathy, and other spiritual gifts that people like Dr. King are espousing. The DEI also doesn't have this kind of recognition of the way public recognition of how faith can help inform this more secularized approach that we're trying to track. And therefore, DEI, where I think it is a helpful approach to thinking about how we engage with one another, does not really look at the basis that can really help to further define it. And so DEI, in my estimation, really has a limited scope because it doesn't have the kind of recognition of the kind of substantive foundations that are contrary to the white narrative of being more, um, more parochial in its approach. Uh, people like Dr. Thurman offer a helpful and complementary corrective to this kind of challenge that DEI um, does not fully recognize. That is these kind of substantive spiritual foundations that I think inform the possibility of DEI having the excess, um, success. His treaties on the disinherited referred to in earlier points that I've made around the historical challenges uh, is very important to how it is we address this DEI approach. In other words, um, that there needs to be a higher value placed on personal transformation for overcoming some of the structural challenges that are before us. Um, in the George Floyd case, for example, what is really revealing about that case is that it was actually a one-on-one -on -one that brought down the, that brought up, if you will, the opportunity for structural conversation to be discussed. Uh, it was his lack of heart. <laughs> it was his lack of embracing some of these kinds of spiritual concepts that are key to a more structural approach that actually brought us to literally the needs of the U.S. context. Uh, in the end, it was this one-on-one -on -one con con uh, context between Mr. Chauvin and Mr. Floyd, where there was this pleading of, I mean, it's as if this case was a metaphor of how it is the tensions between this lack of personal transformation did not lead to a, it has led to a social transformation, but in that moment actually led to the demise of what it is that um, could have happened if there was personal transformation in that moment. Dr. Thurman really helps us to understand how it is that personal transformation can lead to social transformation. And so it is very important for the faith community to understand that the work that we do, whatever our religious perspectives are, is to very much have attention to personal individualistic approaches and values because that is actually the basis in which social transformation can take place. And Dr. Thurman helps us to understand that from his mystical perspective. I think another key ingredient to the possible success of DEI, which needs more attention, is that there needs to be more room for rewriting the conventional narratives. Heretofore, we've had a predominantly white narrative uh, that has informed and has really dominated the ways in which we approach uh, our thinking relative to engagement in public society and even on one-on-one -on -one relationships. Uh, the, the frame of references are predominantly white metaphors and histories. Uh, I remember when I took world history, for example, when I was in high school, and I basically learned European history. I mean, that's primarily what, what the narrative was. World history was actually Europe, as opposed to various perspectives from around the world. There was minimal attention to other histories and narratives and stories in the global context in a world history class that really helped to help others, help the student to understand this kind of globalized context of multi-narratives, the meta-narratives within the world. I think the ecumenical review that Dr. Thuy and I uh, contribute to helps us to understand uh, uh, different perspectives on this, of how it is we write the narrative. Now, it's from a perspective of women of African descent and of Africa, in terms of how we're seeking to rewrite this narrative. But I think this point of rewriting the narrative is going to be key for any kind of larger societal engagement of DEI. There has to be room for that 
And that's throughout all the sectors of the society. Um, and, and that approach needs to be approached with a, with a, uh, a, a sense of humility, of being able to listen. Yesterday, I'm in the middle of a major conference this week uh, on cli uh, climate justice. And yesterday I had the great opportunity to moderate a panel um, about global and domestic perspectives on climate justice. And one of the speakers was from Bolivia, another one was from the indigenous community within the United States. Uh, and then another speaker that was there that was speaking um, out of their context uh, of actually, in, uh, as it turns out, the Pacific Islands. And what was so revealing, and it was all in the chat, was, wow. Like, I mean, people didn't even know like some of these communities even existed. And there were dominant communities in those national contexts, not least of which is the United States. In the United States, just like we have in places like in uh, Indonesia, we have uh, nations within the United States. We have indigenous nations and groups within the United States. But oftentimes when we refer to the United States, we say the United States of America, but we don't mention the particularities, the Virgin Islands, the territories, the, the nations within that were here long before the exportation of European culture and other cultures that have arised since then. So rewriting the narrative, understanding each other's stories, and having that mainstreamed into educational, as uh, my colleague was saying, into knowledge uh, places matters. And so DEI um, has to find a way to fully embrace those narratives. And I think that is biblical. So the ethical questions for the long haul remain. How will people of faith further address and lead the faith engagement of conversions of the heart and not just revision of only just laws and processes? How will the faith community deepen a resolve to dismantle the historic colonial structures and processes that lead to a substantive DEI vision? I believe and many believe that the U.S. is at a crossroads for answering these questions and that the faith community must lead uh, the path of personal conversion uh, with an ethic of love of God, neighbor, and self. Again, George Floyd's case study just, just demonstrates what happens when an individual does not receive and give these gifts. At the same time, social transformation with an ethic of love that leads to repaired communities has to consider approaches to reparatory justice and the redress of structural challenges like racial and gender wealth gap and the dismantling of structural systems that further racialized class inequities, which is a key ethical response for doing this. In other words, reforms are not enough. Conversion. Conversion happens when we deal with the historicity that moves into a new light of possibility, both personally and also for social transformation that can benefit all. This is a very difficult moment in the U.S. as we have this kind of reckoning of what has been the history of, of white domination and as the reality that has always been there of diversity within this U.S. context has been marginalized and now being brought to the center. That's part of what the Black Lives Matter movement is really all about. The Black Lives Matter movement was not just people of African descent, although we were my, my, uh, primarily in the leadership of it, but it really was a coalition like the civil rights movement was in the 60s. It was a broad based coalition and it has actually been globalized um, in this moment. Um, and that kind of young people, global coalitions coming together in this moment, demanding change really matters. And there's a movement that is seeking to look at these historic challenges to lead us into the future. It is in these kind of coming together of these movements where personal relationships are being new, uh, created uh, and being renewed. And the faith community has a role to play in terms of the soul of these movements. There have been people of faith out there as well. 
But I think more and more of this coming together from the faith community with the movements that are taking place in the U.S. and also globally is where we can actually see transformation and not just reforms. And so my hope is that as we move into the future, there will be more of a kind of coming together of conversation for personal transformation that can lead to social transformation. But this pivotal moment offers that opportunity for us to do so. Just a last footnote about the George Floyd case, because we're just living in that moment here in the U.S. in a very important way. Uh, President Obama has actually spoken into this moment about uh, what yet needs to be done. It is good, for example, the milestone that came yesterday relative to the three verdicts of being guilty of the person who did the unthinkable with Mr. Floyd. But this is just a renewed beginning for people in the United States. Going forward, the structural, historic structural injustices still need to be contended with. And the faith community has a major role to play in leading this vision of a beloved community. So hopefully this is helpful to thinking about some of the issues of diversity that we're really wrestling with in the US in this context. Uh, the George Floyd case just happens as we're moving toward, again, this demographic shift that is, quote, an eventuality. How we get there has a lot to do with how the faith community leads.